I'm Caleb Barnes Lens, an expert in female longevity. I speak all over the world on this topic. Um, and I actually just spoke on this exact topic at the biohacking conference in Austin, Texas. And I thought it would be helpful to share it with you. So today we're going to be discussing the strengths that we have as women for longevity and some of the weaknesses. We're also going to talk about the hallmarks of aging. What are they and how we might be able to make interventions and how we might be able to introduce interventions to improve some of these areas that we're gonna have to be concerned about when it comes to aging. So first of all, we know that women live longer than men, and that's about on average five to seven years longer than men. So let's dive into some of the reasons that might be. So first of all is telomere length. Women um, naturally tend to have longer telomeres. Those are the protective caps at the end of the DNA. Really helpful. The next thing is mitochondrial inheritance. So we get these mitochondria from our mothers, and therefore we might have a stronger mitochondria. Great for us. Estrogen's protective effects. So up until we hit perimenopause and really menopause, we have this great amount of estrogen, which is really incredible for healing, protects us against cardiovascular disease, and a wide variety of other chronic ailments. So we want to keep that in mind because as menopause hits or perimenopause, and we start to lose that estrogen, we see the risk of all causes of mortality increase significantly for women. So estrogen is really important and our hormones are really important as women. We also have a lower testosterone. So this might just be we're taking less risk. So whereas men, have this high testosterone pumping through their bodies, they might be more advantageous to skydiving or take a big risk or drive a motorcycle. That risk inherently will put them at a potential for higher mortality. We also have a stronger immune response. This can be really great, but it also can be detrimental to us. So our immune response is amazing. So we can recover quicker from colds or illnesses than our male counterparts. It also presents itself in this explosion of autoimmune conditions in women. I think about 80% of autoimmune conditions are in women. And, you know, a belief is that it could be related to our stronger immune system. We also uh, tend to have lower baseline inflammation, which is great. Our fat distribution is a bit different than men. So men tend to store fat around the uh, organs, which is called visceral fat. That fat is more harmful, more damaging, whereas women tend to store more fat subcutaneously. Okay, so we also know that women need between 10 and 13% essential body fat. Men might be okay at 7, 8, 9, 10, 11%, but women have essential body fat of 10 to 13%. When we get into other healthy body fat ranges, we have athletic from like 14 to 20 fitness 21 to 24 percent average is like 25 to 31 that's like an acceptable range and then obese would be like 32 percent above so the way that we distribute our fat is a little different than men but that subcutaneous fat is less dangerous it's less inflammatory so that's another perk that we have we also have delays in getting cardiovascular disease so we know that cvd or cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in both men and women but women tend to get it later we primarily think because of those protective benefits of estrogen. We also have slightly slower epigenetic uh, aging um, based on just, you know, mass studies. And then we also have the survival of reproductive capacity. So that's another potential idea of why women live longer. We are meant to stay around for our children and grandchildren. We've seen in some studies that if you do have kids older, and I think the idea is that you're actually healthy enough to have kids older naturally, then you will live a little bit longer. Because again, we are evolutionarily meant to be around for our kids to be able to raise them. So this is just an idea. Uh, these are a few of the kind of first principles thinking of why women might be living longer. And um, then we also have a lower risk of mitochondrial mutations. So a little bit better mitochondria and then a lower risk of mitochondrial mutations. So now that we know some of the benefits that we have, some of the protective mechanisms that we have as women as it relates to longevity, let's talk about some of the risks. Major risk number one is muscle loss or sarcopenia. We know that women lose a lot more muscle than men, especially when they get into perimenopause and menopause. Mental health, um, you know that we women are experiencing more mental health conditions. This could be because we have higher rates of depression and anxiety. There's also the medication bias and lack of medical research in women. Women take significantly longer to get a diagnosis than men, and that spans a variety of different years. I mean, it can take a woman between I think seven and 10 years to be diagnosed for something like PCOS or endometriosis. Um, not that those conditions are going to you know, end your life, but this is just an example of, let's say, the medical gaslighting that is occurring with women. I just saw and did a podcast with um, my doctor, Dr. Uh, Sarah Zoll Gottfried, and she shared a study that was posted from um, Forbes Women saying that 72% of women um, feel as if they've been or have been medically gaslit. Where women are told, okay, you've got 
painful periods, that's normal. I mean, if you want, you can take a birth control pill, but that's just part of being a woman. So that's an example of what women are told. But it's not just endometriosis. It's also polycystic ovary syndrome. They're going to the doctor. They're not getting answers. The doctor's not running the right tests. And we also know that there's a lack of research. So women were only required to be included in medical research in the early 1990s. So we don't have a lot of data on us. We're also more susceptible to getting Alzheimer's disease. Um, of course, the hormonal aging and when you hit menopause, like I said, steep increase, the risk of all-cause mortality. That's why when I get to that stage of life, I will definitely be pursuing bioidentical hormone therapy. I know there's a lot of confusion about this because of the Women's Health Initiative about 20 years ago. There are a lot of flaws. I have longer podcasts on this, but basically what I have gleaned from the interviews that are done with medical doctors is that the wrong type of hormones were used. This Synthetic hormones were used. They started it too late, so they started it about 10 years after menopause kicked in. So a lot of those risks had already set in. Um, but I will definitely be doing uh, bioidentical hormone therapy when I get to that stage of my life. It's shown to reduce the, a lot of those risks that are increased uh, with menopause. Next is bone health or osteoporosis is the huge issue for women. We really need to be loading the bones, doing compound lifts, jumps, vibration plates, whatever it is that we can add a mechanical load to our bones super super important because if you have a hip fracture in your older years your risk of dying after that hip fracture in the next year is increased by about 20 to 25 percent so we need to look at our bone health so doing a dexa every year super important understanding your baseline because our bones are not something that we think about all that often we don't think we have weak bones we don't necessarily feel that so if you can get a baseline of your bone health this is super super important because it will be a major risk later. We also have cardiovascular disease, um, as we've talked about a lot, number one killer for men and women. So keeping our heart health, our arteries and veins super flexible and in good condition. So looking at something like an NMR panel, which is going to be a more advanced cardiovascular panel. Also maybe pairing that with a clearly CT soft plaque analysis. It's a bit better than even the calcium score because calcium scores only identify the calcium buildup once it's already occurred. So the clearly soft plaque can actually look into the vessels and determine if you're developing soft plaques, which you can take action on. So really, really important. Maintaining healthy levels of cholesterol, of course, really important. Exercising, high quality sleep, stress management, all of this is really important for her health. I have a ton of other videos on that, so I'm not going to stay on this point for too long. And the last thing is the autoimmune condition. So as mentioned, about 80% of autoimmune conditions are women, a variety of different conditions, but this is something you definitely want to be looking at lab. So hopefully you can catch an autoimmune disorder as it's developing or kind of before it really becomes a full-blown full autoimmune disorder. Um, I actually had an instance where I had had taken antibiotics for um, an, an explant, and then my gut health was really disrupted. I watched my TPO antibodies, which can be related to Hashimoto's thyroiditis, um, I watched them increase. So they went from non-detectable, jumped up to 12, and I started implementing a lot of aggressive approaches to reverse those back down. On my last test, there's absolutely zero. So that just goes to show if you're looking at labs early enough, you can make a significant impact on what the actual outcome is. It's not every single case, but I love that we do have so much power. So I wanted to make this video to talk about some of the benefits of um, being a woman and how we age and then some of the downfalls. As a last piece, I did go over the hallmarks of aging at this talk, so I'm going to share it here. And I'm just going to give a couple of quick points on what these mean. So, so the first one is genomic instability. So this means our genes are becoming more unstable. Then we have cellular senescence. So this is the accumulation of essentially zombie cells. Um, I I really like to do a senescence protocol. So I'm doing um, about 1,000 milligrams of fisetin two times per month. I do that right after the bleed phase of my cycle to just help clear out some of those senescent cells. But that's the next hallmark is the cellular senescence. Next, we have chronic inflammation, or as Mark Hyman calls it, inflammaging. As we get older, we are less able to reduce the amount of inflammation in, their, in our bodies. So my inflammation right now is less than 0 0.03 or less than 0.3. And so it's a very low level of inflammation and I need to keep it there. I'm doing that through diet, lifestyle, exercise, sleep, my nutrition nutrition, what I'm eating, detoxing, and so much more. So improving all of these areas as we age, we know is super helpful. Next is ultra intracellular communication. So our cells just are not communicating well enough. And of course, that's going to lead to dysfunction. Next, mitochondrial dysfunction. So our mitochondria, the powerhouses of our cells as they're often uh, touted as they're becoming more dysfunctional as we age. So a few things that you can do for that is hit exercises is actually going to invoke a process 
called mitochondrial biogenesis, which is going to help improve the quality of the mitochondria that you have. And it can also help with some mitophagy, which is actually killing off some of the bad mitochondria. So HIIT exercises, things like VO2 max, high interval training is really helpful for improving the health of your mitochondria. Also really love red light therapy for this, a supplement called urolithin A. But everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis is going to impact our mitochondria. Next is disabled autophagy. So this is our cellular cleaning and renewal phase. So when we fast, we uh, really increase autophagy. We can do it through some of these different supplements. Like I mentioned, it can help um, like the fisetin or there's some new research on bromidine mimicking autophagy. But letting our bodies have that time to actually clear out bad cells or harmed cells with the process of autophagy is really important. Next is deregulated nutrient sensing. So as we eat or take supplements, we are receiving nutrients and our bodies become less good at using those nutrients and sensing them. So we might be running nutritional deficiencies. The next is telomere attrition. So our telomeres, which are those protective end caps of our DNA again, are getting shorter. That allows DNA to be more exposed to damage. The next is stem cell exhaustion. So we know that if you get an injury, a cut, um, you are harmed in some way, uh, stem cells are released. So stem cells are constantly working on our bodies to kind of patch the holes and repair things that need to be repaired. As we get older, our stem cells become exhausted and they can't repair as well as they once did. Loss of proteostasis. So this has to do with our proteins and how they fold. I mentioned a device that I have. So that is um, the NanoV, which improves protein protein folding, but as we age, we become less able to do this in an efficient and optimal way. Another marker is gut dysbiosis. So we can have gut dysbiosis at any age. I mean, I do a uh, gut zoomer test by Vibrant Wellness every single quarter, and sometimes my gut test is perfect. Sometimes I've been exposed to, you know, a bacteria or a pathogen or uh, some sort of virus, and I need to optimize that. Sometimes, uh, you know, I also have gut imbalances. So it's a constant, like, we are our gut is changing all throughout the day, definitely from day to day, from week to week to month to month, and definitely over years, our gut changes so much just based on our exposures. If we're going outside more, if we're not, if we're drinking one type of water, another type of water, if we're traveling, lack of sleep, all of these things impact our gut microbiome. So that can happen now, but as we age, we definitely have more dysbiosis in the gut. And then the last one is epigenetic alteration. So we have our genes, which are fixed, and you can do a genetic test to figure out what those are. But then we also have our epigenetics, which is this influenceable area. So these epigenetics is kind of turning on or off our genes. So we can have bad genes that are off and then our epigenetics can actually turn those bad genes on. So as we age, our epigenetics become altered and then they might be turning on bad genes and turning off good genes. So these are some of our strengths as women and then also some of our weaknesses. So I hope this is really helpful. If you learned anything from this video, I would love for you to share it. I would love a like, comment, and subscribe. I am only posting female longevity content here. I do throw my husband in from time to time as you do a lot of biohacking together. So if you're interested in this, I would love to have you join my community.